today we will continue our uh, discussion on uh, corrosion protection methods as applicable to uniform corrosion. We listed in the last class that uh, the following methods can be applied to prevent uniform corrosion. It involves uniform corrosion, uh, uniform corrosion prevention methods involves material selection and uh, the protective coatings, inhibitors and we said that the retrochemical techniques. The retrochemical techniques we have two methods, one is uh, cathodic protection, other one is the anodic protection. In the last class we discussed in details about the, uh, the methods of uh, selecting materials depending upon the um, requirements like how critical a, a component is uh, depending upon that you choose a corrosion resistant material actually. Because uh, uh, you know if you are going to increase the corrosion resistance of a material then the cost of the material also goes up. So, the application of the corrosion resistant material also depends upon what depends upon how critical the component is. And we also looked at uh, the two types of uh, uh, metals and alloys, one based on the noble character, the other one is based on whether the metal can offer the passivity. In both cases uh, the criteria of, of uh, the material corrosion resistance uh, we have seen in the, in the last class. We will continue this and the next uh, important aspect of uniform corrosion control is the application of protective coatings. See uh, if you look at from the point of view of wider application of a single technique for corrosion protection protective coating stands first. It is applied at ease, it is applied uh, you know very versatile and uh, in most applications it is possible that you can use a protective coatings. And uh, here we are not going to go in, in detail, we are going to give very broad outline. We will be having a course in the second semester. Uh, which is uh, called as MM650. It is devoted to protective coatings. So, a, a detailed course will be offered on that. Mm. Those who are interested will, will attend that course and you will get a much deeper understanding of protective coatings. We just give an outline here. Uh, again for uh, you want to read more on this you can refer these books. One is uh, ASM handbook, volume 5. Tenth edition. And this is Ohio 1994. This covers almost all kinds of coatings, metallic and non-metallic, uh, polymer coatings, and various types of uh, uh, things. It is on surface engineering. The other book uh, you want uh, more towards the paint coatings, polymer coatings, you can read Charles G. Munger. Okay. 
روشن پریونشن بائی پروٹیکٹو کوٹنگس It's a, it's a NACE publication, 1984, and the, it is, it's, it's Texas. And this is uh, more uh, on paint coatings, organic coatings, but the first book covers um, in detail various aspects of surface engineering that includes coating as well ok. So, those who are really interested to go more in detail I would suggest you refer this uh, these two books actually. Let us go to the coatings. Broadly you can classify the coatings as metallic, a paint or also called as organic coating. You can like to add this along with that as the conversion coating. The conversion coating is uh, not really a full fledged, uh, you know, standalone coatings many times. The conversion coating uh, helps probably other coatings. In few cases, the conversion coating can be a standalone coating. Let us look at briefly what are these uh, types of coatings. If you go to metallic coating, You can classify them based on the, the way you apply the coatings. You can have electrode deposition, you can have hot dip, you can have thermal spray. Uh, in fact, I want to add uh, along with electrode deposition, which is also a variant of it is called electroless deposition. So, these are the broad classification based on the way you apply. You also have other you know you have some physical vapor deposition and you know there are several other magnetron sputtering widely used relatively in large quantities. These are the type of coatings used for corrosion resistance application. Otherwise, you have a variant of several types of applications. We are not going to be focusing on that ok, but these are all uh, generally used in large numbers. If you ask me the most widely used of course, is, is, is a hard dip coating this thing. The second one is your electrode deposition, the third is thermal spray. The thermal spray is becoming more and more popular now actually. The time the, the, the extent of application of thermal spray coating increases. Now, if you look at uh, uh, you go a little more into details about these coatings, 
you would say you can have relatively active metals or you can call as anodic coatings and uh, you can also have relatively uh, noble coatings. This is you can call as a cathodic coatings. Uh, most of these classifications are in relation to the steel you know not necessarily to steel, but steel is very widely used and required protection. So, when we normally talk about anodic and uh, you know cathodic coatings we refer only with respect to the substrate, the substrate here is steel. If you change the substrate it is possible that what was anodic to steel may not be anodic to some other metal. Now, suppose you take steel as the substrate which is widely used, you have zinc coatings, cadmium coatings, these are all relatively the anodic coatings, nickel, copper, silver, gold, tin. these are all relatively noble coatings. The active coatings they go by sacrificial action. We will see this later hmm. what is in the sacrificial. The noble coatings mostly is as sort of barrier you can say. you do not allow the corrosion to occur because they are relatively noble the rate of corrosion of this metal or relatively relatively um, less compared to the substrate. Each of these coatings have their advantages and disadvantages. Noble coatings sometimes can cause it can cause a galvanic corrosion we will see this later. But the surface can look very bright, you give a nickel coating surface looks very bright. To this you can also add chromium, you can also add chromium to this, chromium is also um, is, is widely used ok. In these metallic coatings you see zinc and aluminum are used as hot dip, hot dip. Even tin can be used as hot dip coatings and the metals uh, high melting metals difficult to hard dip, difficult to coat by hard dip process. Technique, because the melting point is so high, the substrate might warp, substrate may melt, all this can happen. Zinc and uh, tin and aluminum are widely coated uh, by hard dip process ok. Now, the high melting metals, now these metals, so high melting metals how can you coat, how do you coat, yeah, either do thermal spray, yes or you can do electro deposition.
you can also use electrolysis deposition. But again there are some restriction in all cases it is not that you can you can do it, but I just give a broad picture about if you talk about retro deposition you want to have an example of this you can do copper you can have um, silver gold chromium you can do that that way you can even coat tin you can coat cadmium you can coat zinc also they may not be high melting metals, but you can coat them by electro they call as electro galvanizing right electro galvanizing is quite common. So, that way zinc is a little unique you can coat by thermal spray you can coat people do by thermal spray people coat by electro uh, deposition people coat by hot dip process all all are possible with, with, with zinc actually. Electrolysis deposition here you coat you can coat generally copper you coat uh, you can coat silver you can coat let us say gold you can also coat nickel. Thermal spray widely you can do you can use again zinc you can have aluminum that way most metal that you can do actually you know zinc and aluminum is a very widely used is coatings ok. Uh, complex alloys are done by the thermal spray necroli and crocroli all this kind of high temperature coatings are done stellite coatings are done. So, there are other coatings people use thermal spray as a technique to do that ok. So, they are high temperature hard coatings it also give you high corrosion resistance. So, that is also possible ok. I do not think we should get into discussion about too much discussion about what these techniques are you know electron deposition means what you make the substrate as a cathode you pass a DC current you get uh, the coating on this on the substrate. The thermal spray you melt it and throw it at high velocity and they go and get deposited on the surface. The electrolysis deposition you do not pass current, but what you do normally you add a reducing agent in the bath ok. So, that reducing agent reduce reduces copper, silver or gold or nickel on the surface and forms the coating it is very important. If the reduction takes place in the bulk and no use everything becomes a powder. So, so they are very catalytic surface catalyzes. So, most of the coating occur on the surface by electrolysis deposition. So, these details we will not go into you know in this course now in the other course you will uh, read them a lot. Now, uh, that is about the metallic coatings. Let us uh, get into the paint coatings. Mostly organic coatings. There are several coatings, lots of coatings, but the important are alkyl. Okay. acrylic coatings, you have uh, epoxy, so polyurethane, nowadays you have silane coatings and each of these coatings they have their uniqueness. But these coatings they act as a 
physical barrier see they are inert mostly they are inert by nature they are suppose not to allow water in the system but you know organic coatings are not impervious to water it slowly permeates and so it limits the life of these coatings okay however it is okay to say that these paint coatings are termed as the barrier type of coatings they don't allow the water to permeate and reach the substrate okay and so it is it isolates the environment it isolates the water can happen now in the coat in the in the in the paint coatings how it is done if you look at a paint coating generally it consists of minimum of two layers one you must have a primer you would have a top coat sometimes you may have more layers you can also have intermediate layer intermediate layers you can have intermediate layer or it can be layers it can be have many many things you can have okay the purpose of the primer the primer the purpose is to provide adhesion first and foremost is it provides adhesion to the substrate the primer may also have some additives to this there are some additives but a few of them i can say they can inhibit corrosion you may have some inhibitors they may have some kind of you know additives like like zinc and all like that they may have they can have sacrificial action primer is in fact is a key in the painting process the top coat gives you maybe other properties it might give you like sometimes you know chipping resistance it may give you uv resistance there are other properties in fact the paints if you take it is very versatile because you could have n number of properties at your disposal you can have different color for example it can be anti graffiti you know write something it, it don't stick onto surfaces or you could have water repellent properties several properties uh, are are tailored on the top coatings the intermediate uh, layer also can have different properties because it to augment the corrosion the intermediate layers are given okay so the primers when you talk about these primers can be based on alkyd primer acrylic primer epoxy primers polyurethane primer all this kind of primers okay so these primers you know are the key without applying primers i don't think you are going to apply a coating at all this is the key in the 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 paint coating of uh, of any metal substrates uh, in the conversion coatings we have like phosphates
in the phosphate and you also have um, chromate conversion coating right. The phosphate has several classification take a phosphate for example, this you will have simply a iron phosphate coating. have zinc phosphate third is uh, the manganese phosphate you can say overall the protection ability of the phosphate coating increases from iron phosphate to zinc phosphate to manganese phosphate ok. The protection ability protection increases from iron phosphate to zinc phosphate to, to manganese phosphate. What do they really do? What do you mean by conversion coating? What do you, what is what is happening here? You are converting the substrate into a, a phosphate. For example, if I have iron, the iron is converted to iron phosphate. This is an insoluble. salt. So, it is insoluble salt it provides resistance against corrosion and sometimes the phosphate also can act as a inhibitor. These phosphates are also given as a pre treatment before you coat you apply a paint coating ok. It can be pre treatment can be pre treatment for painting. You do this in the, in the automobile for example, in automobile the automobile industry they they apply a fascinating treatment. Even in the case of aluminum alloys, uh, zinc alloys, zinc they give a like a chromating they do that and then they apply a painting. So, they also enhance the addition strength of the paint coatings. In the case of manganese sulphate it can be a standalone coating it can be can be a standalone can be a standalone alone coating. Whereas, uh, iron phosphate and zinc phosphate are not stand alone you again over that you apply a paint coating. Chromating is the issue here chromating we people use uh, chromium 6 plus people use it very effective. What is the problem? It is arsenogenic, it is almost now banned in many cases. So, people start using uh, CR3 plus or is being used. And even this is uh, now not allowed in the case of steel, but it is allowed in the case of used for like aluminum, magnesium, zinc for these cases they use 
otherwise the chromate is one of the most efficient least expensive type of conversion coating for most of the metals. In the same line you have one more type of you may call it as conversion coating if you wish you call them as anodizing. What is anodizing? It is done for aluminum alloys, aluminum and its alloys is that. So, they convert the surface what do they do into an oxide. Now, oxide is already corroded right is is a, is a corroded product it is uh, if it is forms a forms a film which is adherent resist the corrosion. Again it is not a very simple and uh, you know you need to anodize it there are pores you need to seal them it is a technology of anodizing should be understood properly. I am just giving you various options available for us to uh, for use for corrosion prevention of alloys. But again anodizing cannot be applied widely right it is used for it is used for aluminum alloys. It can be used for titanium alloys for example, ok. But the most widely used is 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 aluminum. In this also there are two cases um, uh, you know this one is called also called as hard anodizing. It is used for the wear resistance it is quite hard aluminum is uh, alumina is very hard. So, in order to get a similar thing people also go for we call as plasma electrolytic oxidation. It is uh, done for um, aluminum very nicely. Now, people have also developed it for magnesium, it gives you extremely hard coating. The main purpose here is to provide hardness, wear resistance, corrosion is secondary in this case, ok. Now, we have seen you know a sketch of different type of coatings that are, that are available for us. What I would like to uh, now just discuss with you is what are the requirements of the coating, when do you get a good coating, ok. The first and foremost is adhesion. It is a big subject actually. The way the adhesion is developed, it varies from the coating to coating. If you talk about electrode deposition or you talk about hard deep coating, the bond between the coating and the substrate is metallic. But in the case of uh, a paint coating, the bond more often comes by a mechanical interlocking. The surface is rough, the paint goes and then locks by itself. So, in all these cases, surface preparation becomes very important because it is surface that connects the substrate and the coating the surface is not clean, the surface is not properly prepared, I do not think you can ever get a good coating at all. So, surface preparation is an important aspect of this. A lot of standards are there for that to, to, to 
to uh, to understand to follow. The second aspect of that is the nature of the coating. You see each coating they have their own properties inherent properties right. If you say a zinc coating it is sacrificial take a copper coating it is noble coating. You take a paint coating for example, epoxy coating if you take you, it is resistance to chemical resistance it has got very additions, but it is not good from U resistance point of view. But if you take acrylic it is good for U resistance point of view polyurethane is a tough. So, nature of the coating also plays important role in terms of its performance of that actually. The third the application method. The same coating can be applied by different means it can be hard dip coating or it can be electro deposition coating zinc. For example, a hard dip coating hard dip uh, galvanized coating and the electro deposition coating the formability suppose you take the metal and then you know sheet and bend it the formability of electro galvanized coatings are far superior compared to the formability of hard dip coatings. Similarly, if you take a paint coating you can apply through brush you can apply through spray I mean you can do uh, electrophoretic coatings several ways that you can apply the coating the performance of these coatings are going to be different. And the substrate is going to decide about it. And I call a structure, I say macro structure, macro. If you are going to have a electro deposition of sharp edges, different, intricate components are different, you cannot quote them, say the substrate nature, the way substrate is there. Of course, the performance of the coating also depends upon or it depends upon the environment. Coating and you can also add there is a performance. All this will be discussed uh, much in more detail in the in the MM650 course when you when you uh, take it in the next semester. The coatings, you have any anybody has any questions? This is more informative rather than going much into details. Yeah. You said that we do not use CR3 plus for steels. Why is it so? See what happens is no all said and done we do not want chromium per se for use in any structures. Why why we do not use uh, why we do not use chromium 3 plus uh, chromium 6 plus steel is that we have other alternatives we can have phosphates right. In fact, the European Union now even banning the phosphate also now they are going to non phosphate based silent base you know uh, which consists of the titanium containing silicon containing all this kind of things. So, most of this uh, you know uh, regulations come from the environmental issues. Now, until you find a solution people still start using that. They have found alternative for iron steel. So, they use and aluminum is still is a problem. I think there are certain uh, deadlines even for that. They have to replace chromium totally <coughs> with respect to aluminum and magnesium and all actually. So, it is a matter of developing technology to find alternatives ok. Chromium is bad either way you can you can use that is good question actually ok. So, let us move to the, the next uh, topic which is uh, yeah, please. If we are uh, using chromium in uh, making steel also that and in stainless steel that is also forming a layer of chromium. 
outside on the top of stainless steel? Yeah, it is a good question actually. Yeah. Yeah, I mean chromium, nickel, uh, these are all not very good. In fact, nickel is even more dangerous actually, ok. You, if you uh, if you if you wear a ring of nickel, you know, you see skin will be very allergic to that actually. The difference between uh, the stainless steel and the coating is it forms a very, very thin oxide on the surface. You know already that you know with the amount the thickness of the passive layer they are less than 100 angstroms and then they do not very easily dissolve ok and they just, just remain on the, on the surface quite long actually. And if you calculate the rate of dissolution corrosion of steel they are they are not they are not in microns per year something like that. So, the extent of corrosion that you can happen is very very less ok, but nevertheless ok it can cause a problem especially uh, there are cases where people do not want to use the body implant for example, we discussed the other day ok. There you are extremely careful about all this actually nickel you do not want to have nickel and some of the stainless steels people replace nickel with manganese and nitrogen and high chromium content. So, uh, there are of course, issues ok and then uh, we only have to see how best that you can tackle them into that actually. Yeah. Any other questions? Ok. So, let us go to the, the next topic thank you um, is on inhibitors. Now, inhibitors are added or compounds. they can be organic compound or it can be inorganic compound. Compounds added in small quantities, but what happens? But bring out bring out a significant reduction in the corrosion rate. For example, if you really want to not worry too much about environmental issues, if you add a few ppm of chromate like potassium dichromate and all like that you add ok, the corrosion rate of of steel in acid can be reduced by by even 98 percent. There are several several inhibitors uh, like you have amines, azoles, Even, even you know alcohols ok. In amine there can be uh, aliphatic, aromatic and ring over so many you know kind of uh, amines are there, A secondary amine, tertiary amine, so many kinds of uh, compounds are available to do that. You can also have molybdates, Can have zincates also. Okay, you can have silicates. These are inorganic kind of uh, compounds. There are organic compounds. In fact, if you look at some of the publications, I know there are thousands of publications where people develop lot of inhibitors. Nowadays, people talk about green inhibitors they extract them from the plant and start using them and uh, so they they are in fact used in specific applications. When I say specific application where the environment is confined 
obviously you know what do you mean by confined for example, I, I, I want to uh, pickle steel right what is this called descaling right you want to do descaling is one of the very widely used operation ok. You have a an oxide you know a magnetic oxide or a wood site you know or maybe hematite formed on the steel I want to remove this scale you can do a mechanical removal you can do or you can do a chemical removal you can do that. And chemical removal is called pickling you normally people use acids right they use acid. The acid dissolve what are it dissolves what dissolves the scale right. But you can start attacking the steel you do not want the steel to be attacked. So, when add an acid sorry to, to acid we add an inhibitor attack on metal is reduced. The other example is um, cooling water systems in industry. That is, there are heat exchangers. Your refrigerator is heat exchanger, right? So they add uh, they add inhibitors to it to reduce the corrosion. Of metals by water, okay. They are lots of inhibitors. In fact, I use it, okay. And the cooling water. This cooling water here is is it's recirculated. Sometimes inhibitors are added to coatings also. A paint coating. You can add strontium chromate. Okay, they add to it. Yeah, I will I will come to that it is a good question ok. I will come to that we add a very small quantity how does it uh, you know lower the corrosion rate of a metal ok. So, it has a limited application of course, it is not very wide application, but they are critical applications. If you do not use uh, you know inhibitors in cooling water system you cannot use stainless steels even stainless steels you cannot use copper based alloys you cannot use in some cases if people use even carbon steel they use. So, it is not possible to use them, but mind you that this water is recirculated similarly the boiler you know application ok. The water is being recirculated you cannot use corrosion of structures in sea water can you do that you cannot add it because it is simply not possible to change the environment at all actually. So, in a limited uh, you know um, applications the inhibitors are very successfully employed uh, to prevent the corrosion of, of metals. And the question is what is the mechanism? or what are the mechanisms if not only one mechanism. One they do by adsorption do two is uh, film formation third it could be scavenging action. Scavenging you can remove the species responsible for corrosion ok. I will give some example here to to understand ok, understand how this mechanism in practice really function. 
So, let us look at the adsorption. Let us take an amine. How many of you know amine? It has got N H group. This may be some R alkyl group, something like that. It is it is a primary amine, right? If you take amine, what is special about this nitrogen molecule? What is special about this molecule? I am sorry, what is special about this nitrogen atom? It is polar, a lone pair of electrons are there. There are lone pair of electrons are available. So, it is a relatively negative charge. So, it can adsorb onto the metal surface. Okay. You can have similarly a sulfur kind of thing. Okay. You have oxygen. There are several kinds of of uh, of of the functional groups. Most of them are polar in nature. They can get adsorbed on the metal surfaces. When they get adsorbed on the metal surfaces, on the metal surfaces, there are several things. You know, now what happens? That depends upon the Fourier change for adsorption. Adsorption or absorption, both you can call about it. If it is more negative, it is going to absorb much more effectively. And why it happens? So, that is why a lot of chemistry people develop so many molecules, you know, bigger size molecules means it is easier to absorb on the metal surfaces. It talks about steric, it talks about polarization, several factors, not worry about it, okay. They get adsorbed. When they adsorbed, you can adsorb on the anodic side or on the cathodic side or can adsorb on both. Now, assume that it is it is now adsorbing on the anodic side can I find out by some test it is getting absorbed on the anodic side. You now you expert now in electrochemistry you know how to carry out tests you know all this right. You know polarization. How do I know the molecule is absorbing on the anodic side? Yeah, yeah it is activation polarization. So, what happened in activation polarization? You are there, but you I want to be a little bit more specific. It control for example, it absorbs on the anodic side. What happened to anodic reaction? Well, what will happen to anodic kinetics? What will happen? Increase or decrease? It decrease, right? If the if the anodic kinetics are decreasing, so how will it be revealing electrochemically? You know all this, right? You have seen a lot of diagrams and all you've drawn, something, right? What happens? Yeah, you know it. Current, of course, will decrease. Corrosion rate will decrease, right? But how? But how do you know it is an anodic inhibitor? And how do you know it is a cathodic inhibitor? How do we find out? Come, you guys know quick. You do a test in the lab. And then come out with the results. Say, oh, this is an anodic inhibitor. What is the parameter that will tell you that it is an anodic, it is an anodic inhibitor? Yeah, table slope. You agree with him? Which ta which table slope you think will happen? Which one? There are two table slopes, right? Yeah, beta, beta A, right? So it is the anodic table slope that is going to be changing. That will it will increase or decrease? You think it will? It will increase, right? It will increase because the current will not be, the current is not going to be more, the current will be decreasing, right? So, the slope will be. So, 
if I if I plot if I plot if I look at a at, at a Evans diagram and if I get a I get a I this is without inhibitor ok. I have added an inhibitor and I get this like this. What is this inhibitor called? What is this inhibitor called? What is this inhibitor called? Are you sure? Ah, oh, see, he has got the answer. Is he right? It is cathodic. Re it is cathodic reaction, right? So it is a cathodic inhibitor. It inhibits a cathodic reaction, right? So it is a cathodic inhibitor, right? On the other hand, if the slope goes like this, what happens? This, what is this inhibitor called? An anodic inhibitor. If I add uh, an inhibitor, I get both anodic and cathodic, both are getting red, slopes are increasing. What will happen? You call that as a mixed type inhibitor. So, it is possible for us to, 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 to quantify and the extent of inhibition, it is also possible for us to know the mechanism through which the inhibition is really occurring on the surfaces. Agreed or not agreed? I hope you will be able to recollect your image diagrams, right. So, please understand this. Now, now what is the consequence of that? Look at this, if it is a cathodic inhibitor, what happens to ECAR? E car goes up or goes down? Goes down, the anodic inhibitor the it goes up, but at the same time I car also decreasing, right. So, so this is how you, you try to understand the role of inhibitors and how the inhibitors um, uh, you know function um, for different types of metals. Understood or not understood? Okay. Now it is a film forming is one more type. An example uh, of this is um, is um, benzotriazole. and uh, uh, this is copper in let some acid maybe in copper in hydrochloric acid. The benzodriazole is a compound, it is organic compound ok. You, you, you dissolve it, in fact it is very difficult to dissolve in aqueous solvent, you dissolve it in some alcohol or something and add small quantities in hydrochloric acid. What can happen is they form a very, very thin film very thin film is formed, very thin film of benzo, benzo triazole. There are several types of azoles, dolytriazole and mecapta benzo triazole kind of compounds and these are all sulfur compounds. Sulfur containing containing aromatic compound. So, they form a barrier for corrosion. Of course, the sulfur also absorbs, it does both, ok, but it forms a nice film on the surface. The next one is uh, is uh, is scavenging. I would say scavenger. You want to call it, and it is done in the case of boilers. For example, oxygen is is a is a molecule 
which is going to be involved in the the corrosion process you, you all know what it can be done you can add compounds like hydrazin hydrazin and this is uh, i think n2 h2 it combined with oxygen and forms nitrogen and plus water like this can happen. Sodium sulphide what does it happens it becomes sodium sulphate. So, there are several other efficient compounds which are added to water to remove the oxygen content they are called as scavengers. Um, well, I have um, one more topic to be covered which is anodic protection and cathodic protection. I am not sure whether we can finish it, but let us start with the principle ok. Let us start with the principle of this one. Let us take this um, this is electrochemical technique ok, electrochemical methods we call it. The two uh, methods one is cathodic protection two is the anodic protection. they work diametrically opposite way in preventing the corrosion of the metal. We have seen uh, how the electrochemical reaction occurs for corrosion right. Let us take the let us take the uh, case of cathodic protection. if you uh, I think we will be also having a having a course wherein we are going to discuss in detail, but uh, will be very brief here that is M M 712 ok advances design and control of so there we will be discussing in detail i think you know about 12 13 lectures we will be talking in detail about the cathodic protection what we will be talking about here is a very brief uh, discussion on the cathodic protection principles only we can do that And again, you want to read more in detail if you do not attend the course. Suppose you want to read, you can read this book. Peabody's control of uh, pipeline corrosion. second edition it was edited by so edited by R L Bianchetti and it is again a NACE publication. Texas 2001. It is a nice book um, mostly focused on um, pipeline related cathodic protection 
and uh, it also deals with the coatings as applicable to pipelines and uh, you do not of course, talk about cathodic protection of the tanks and all this stuffs are not there, but it is a very nice book uh, you can look at the basics you can get a better picture about what the cathodic protection is. Let us start understanding an electrochemical corrosion ok. Let us recollect that what you said. We said that in the electrochemical corrosion a metal is involved exposed to the environment the metal is getting oxidized in the environment maybe some n electrons are released. So, you have n electrons are released on the substrate. Some species from the environment ok, some species from the environment they will take this electron and they get reduced. Some oxidized species they take this electron and get reduced into reduced species and this is a metal. This is uh, the corrosion process. right the when it is corroded the metal exhibits a potential which is equal to what is the potential called what is the potential when the metal is corroding if you measure that potential using a reference electrode what is the potential called it is a it is a corrosion potential right so it's a corrosion potential at that potential the rate of oxidation of the metal equals to the rate of reduction of the species involved in the corrosion process. The metal is quite neutral right am I right metal is metal surface is quite neutral because the number of electrons released are consumed by the species from the environment. Now, what we are going to do is suppose I am going to now I am going to pump electrons here I am going to pump electrons on the surface I am going to put more electron I am going to flood the surface with electrons. So, what happens look at this diagram if the surface is flooded with electrons. what would happen to this corrosion process? There are two there are two reactions here right one reaction is metal going as m n plus plus n electrons right. The other reaction involved is some species take away this electrons like this. When I am flooding this surface with electrons what do you think will happen? Yeah, I want you to spell out clearly tell me yeah, yeah it does polarize the reaction this is reaction 1 reaction 2 it polarizes right. So, what will happen to the corrosion what happened to these reactions yeah what will happen to reaction 1 what will happen to reaction 2 the reaction 1 will slow. will get slow down when you have more electron that means as well forget about electrochemistry as per the lead Chatelier principle the reaction will revert back because you are supplying more electrons here. So, the reaction will turn towards like this what will happen to second second reaction will increase actually. So, you find the metal surface the rate of corrosion increase decreases whereas, the other reduction reaction rate increases. So, when you put this more and more electrons on the surface that is what really happens and that process is called as cathodic protection. Now, the there are this is simple the simple concept is very simple 
I have more electrons on the surface and so automatically the oxidation of the metal is getting reduced. But of course, the cathodic reaction which is uh, you know which normally takes electrons the rate of that reaction will increase and this is the essence of cathodic protection of metals. So, I stop here ok.